That Force Radio. That Force Radio is rated M for mature. Or should that be immature? Hey guys, Dustin Wynn. Hey, this is Scott Snyder. This is Paul Dini. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio. You're listening to Bat Force Radio. This is Tom King. I write Batman Bitch. And this is Bat Force Radio. Welcome back to Bat Force Radio, the Batman and DC podcast with no limits, and we may just be pushing that here today. So let's take a look at the round table. We've got the Trunkler in Chicago. Hey, what's going on, guys? Legends of Lego Batman in California. Oh, cheers. Grandpa Batman in Texas. Hey, how's it going? Uh, the Bat Force Times in New York. And I'm Robin Cross in Canada. All right, today, this is a special one. Everybody's been waiting for a long time. In September of 2018, DC Comics released the first book under their newly launched Black Label imprint. Unknown at the time to most, or maybe to anyone, the imprint would eventually replace Vertigo, while also changing from an imprint what Jim Lee is calling an intended age label. Uh, regardless, Black Label began with the perfect book to put on display what was intended to be produced under its name. With the first of a three issue series from Brian Azzarello and Lee Bermeo titled Batman Dam. Unfortunately, these newly loosened limitations on content proved to be beyond what some were prepared to handle, as the issue drew attention for some wrong reasons, which deflected much of the focus away from the high level of quality that the creators had produced. After editorial delays, issue three will finally see the light of day on June 26th, and returning to the show to take us through it all, a man who proved himself too dark for Black Label itself. Mr. Lieberman. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you for taking the time to do this. Uh, it's been a while coming. We've been waiting for this to happen. My so, pleasure. So, My so, pleasure. Since the last time we talked, uh, how's life been with you? <laughs> uh, it's, it's been good. Um, it's been uh, it's been a roller coaster ride. It's been quite the experience this entire this entire project. So um, yeah, and and now that uh, the third issue is out on the stands next Wednesday, it's just nice to kind of um, be done with it and, and finally um, be able to talk about some of this. Uh, Brian and I both made a point of not um, not really going out and saying much of anything because. Uh, we just wanted people to read the book and then, you know, we would talk more about it, everything, uh, when everything was out. So, um, it's nice to know that we have arrived at that, at that moment in time. So, We've all just read the book and I mean, the weight was worth it. I mean, the payoff of this book is going to blow some people's mind. We were kind of talking about it before you got on. And, you know, one thing that we liked is that how it's this, it's this, mind fuck the whole time it's like a mystery with a horror element with some supernatural and then it also kind of shows the eternal struggle and battle with batman and joker hmm. and uh, i can't wait for people to get this book and read it yeah i mean you, you and me both I, I when brian and i first started to talk about the book um, everything we'd done before was kind of a linear story that was very much um, realistic, or as or as realistic as maybe you can go with. It. And we were just like, I don't, we don't, we don't want to do that again. You know, at least uh, it was something I, I definitely didn't want to do again. I, I wanted to kind of push the boundaries, and I, I'm a big fan of, um, I'm a big fan of, of storytelling that, that doesn't doesn't necessarily. Uh, um, flow a lot of times, especially in the West, which is um, you see a lot more of it in uh, you know Chinese, Japanese, and Korean cinema, and and um, and there are forms of storytelling that aren't necessarily quote unquote Western, where you know we've kind of been programmed to have like this uh, three arc narrative that um, that pays off in a very specific way. You know what I mean? And and uh, the one one thing I remember talking to Brian about. At the beginning was um, I, I wanted to do something that felt like a nightmare, 
You know, I wanted to do something that felt like, you know, in a, in, in a nightmare or in a dream in general. And it, this gets tricky because some people really don't like that. For you know, don't like the Lynchian, David Lynchian kind of style of storytelling, and I totally get that. But you know, the there for me, it's it's an interesting, specifically with a character like Batman, because because of the nature of the character and all of the best, or what I would consider to be some of the best Batman stories, they tend to be very linear. You know, Year One, um, Killing Joke. Mm. Even though Killing Joke has flashbacks, it's a very linear story with a very specific kind of pay payoff, mm. and. Um, and and so I wanted to do to do something that felt different, and because and because we had this opportunity with this new label, which was supposed to be a, an uh, and now I kind of use the term chuckling to myself adult adult label. We we really wanted to try to play around with that, knowing full well that a lot of people would be like, "What the fuck?" Like, and, you know, <laughs> I, 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 we were we were well aware that people would get to the end of this thing and go. What? Like, what was, you know, like the, the big thing you read a lot on Twitter now is, was that necessary? Was that story necessary? Was it, you know, people love, love to throw that around, which always cracks me up because I'm just like, well, is any of this really necessary? I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an exor- it's an exercise in trying to do something uh, different with a character that, you know, has been around for a long time, 80 plus years. Yeah, the, the point was to try, try to do a nightmare, was try try to do something that felt like, it had a bit of that vibe where unexpected stuff can happen and, and characters might not necessarily behave in the way that people expect them to behave for reasons that more or less you reveal more in the end. So like the end of issue two, you know, hopefully I, everybody lost their, seemed to lose their shit over that when that came out. And um, yeah, I remember reading like someone saying, Oh, hardly, hardly cuts herself. I'm like, has no one ever seen an, opto- an autopsy scar before? Like, do, do people not, do people not know what an autopsy scar is? What a big fucking clue that is, or what yeah. a big fucking hey, something is wrong here, you know? But right. anyway, yeah, we spoke about that the last time in terms of uh, how much potential Black Label did have, and I know you were, <clears throat> said you were an avid fan of like say european comics as well and how i always thought america should go in that direction for a main publisher like a a, a, not i I hate to use the word mature because what other countries lay they don't even use that word it's like you know um violence or some wording or sex is just part of everyday life as long as it's subtle and natural in the everyday scheme of things within storytelling and we always felt like it was two steps forward and one step back in terms of what happened with this whole ordeal and whatnot sure. uh, are you allowed to touch up on uh what actually went down and how it all came to be in terms sure. of, yeah you know yeah. The, uh, while adding on that what why we didn't even get a second reprint actually right right no uh, um yeah uh, you know i'll tell you guys everything um awesome. uh, you know, i hope i don't bore anybody listening either this might be a little long so so bear with me i'm wide awake but this is what everyone's been reading okay. for in the community. So don't right, 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 right. So, okay, so let's go back to Joker coming out in 2008. <laughs> That's how far back this goes, guys. Nice. Um, Joker comes out. Joker comes out in 2008. Uh, does really well. No one expected the book to do as well as it did. And DC found themselves without a whole lot of other content like that. And so. They started in the Vertigo offices where we did we did Joker through the Vertigo offices. Uh, uh, Will Dennis um, uh, started banding around this idea about doing a Vertigo version of mainstream DC superhero characters, and the idea was to start that line with uh, something that was in, internally called the Joker verse at the time because it was just going to be spinoff books from Joker. So. Um, I wanted to do Catwoman. Brian was going to do Batman with Cliff Chang, but it was going to be like uh, Batman from the uh, Detectives 27 with the gun and like short gloves and stuff. I mean, it was going to he was going to go back to the beginning. Um, there was going to be a, a, a number of different projects that were going to be done all within the Joker universe, though. So they all had to kind of take place in our reality and the reality we set up in the, in the Joker book. And that went no went nowhere. I started doing Batman well while all that was kind of being talked about. And then um, as far as I know, the idea was squashed. Uh, the idea was squashed internally by a few different people. But I know Jim Lee was really behind the idea. And it just the other 
people involved at the time in power did not uh, did not like that idea. And I think still do not very much like that idea. And that's we're going to get to that later. But um, uh, flash forward two and a half, three years ago, and uh, things have changed at DC, um, but not but not like now. Uh, and and basically, um, Jim talks to Brian Azzarello and, and I and, and says, hey, we're going to start up that uh, that idea again. We're going to call it Black Label. And it's going to be a uh, – and Black Label let, – let's clear this up too. Black Label is actually Will Dennis's idea too. It, it, the Joker verse thing – wound up he wound up calling it like we want to do like the black label version of dc characters so i mean he's he's the one who, who even came up with that with that name jim said we're going to re- revive this black label idea i'm going to be kind of spearheading it and um and we want you guys to do the first the first book brian and i had been talking for a long time about doing a sequel to joker uh but we could never really settle on the idea and an idea that i really thought worked and i think brian was always um kind of you know, back and forth on things too. I know he had some other project at the time internally that was like a Batman in hell story Mm. that was going to be part of some larger DC crossover that never happened. And um, what wound up happening was we started taking ideas that we wanted to do from Joker Two. I loved all these justly dark characters. So I was, I had this hard on to do all those supernatural characters it was just like things just came together, you know, things just kind of gelled and we, we knew, um, we knew what kind of story we wanted to tell. Um, we pretty much knew how it was going to tie into Joker because we knew we wanted it to be kind of a quasi sequel to Joker, but not something that people needed to read Joker to, to get or vice versa. Um, just something that kind of made the idea a bit more richer because we, we've just been used to doing our, our own little, pocket universe anyway with, with almost everything we've done so i start batman damn december 2016 everything's groovy mark doyle is the editor of the line editor of the series i love mark doyle to this day he's a great he's a great editor he's 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 um definitely one of the good ones at dc and will dennis uh who is no longer at dc was also freelancing and co-editing the book so we had our team from joker and everything everybody was kind of back it was like we got the band back together (laughs) to to do this to do this book i do 20 pages 18 to 20 pages of the first issue normal size and all of a sudden um it turns out they want to do this new format and so they asked me if I can adjust all the pages that I've drawn to the new size. So that happens about, I, I don't know, five, six months into the whole process. So I basically go in and um, retool all of those pages to make them work on the new spec sizes. But I have to say, I, I was really excited to do it because um, I love the format. I think it was really as soon as I started playing around with, with that format more, I, I was like, wow, this is, this is the way to go for me. But uh, so I was really happy to do that at the end of the day. So um, at the same time, I was working on the now defunct Justice League Dark movie. So I was doing designs for that and um, that wound up never happening. And, and, um, and so uh, because, of all, because of those two things happening at the same time, a lot of those design elements worked their way into this book. So, um, so basically, what wound up happening there is we just started going full bore. Brian was um, Brian was writing everything Marvel style, so he was just doing plot like a, a detailed plot, and um, it was awesome. I mean, everything seemed to be running pretty smoothly. We finished the first issue. We're well into the second issue when they started. Um, you know, promoting and everything. And, and, uh, things, things looked pretty good at that point in time. Um, I had just finished issue two when the first issue hit the stands. So when that happens, Oh, let let me take you back a little bit further. So that year at San Diego, this would be last summer, DC decided to print out a gallery and this was the infamous, uh, Robin, you remember this from from um, Fan Expo. So yeah. they put this galley and it sent out everywhere. Okay, I mean this thing was all over the place. the The issue that comes up later is that galley was printed quite dark. It was really 
um, way too dark, I felt like. Um, and it had nothing to do with me needing to show what was eventually shown. It was just, it was really dark. I felt like the colors got really muddy. And so, um, so that summer I went into the DC offices and we, we lightened up the pages with production. So, I mean, that was done in, in the offices. Um, See, I thought I thought that that was done intentionally, just not to kind of blow the load before the book came out. You know what I mean? No, no, okay. that, that that I mean, if that was the case, if that was the case, it was never made aware. I was never made aware of that. Um, it was really an experimentation on the format, the paper stock, oh, okay. because they actually they actually changed the paper stock from that gallon to what was actually printed. So they actually tweaked some things internally. So the, so what happens is the issue comes out. Um, it gets on Stephen Colbert and people start, you know, basically talking about it. But if, from my point of view, at that point in time, it was just kind of people were just kind of chuckling about it. It didn't really seem like anything negative at all. Even the Colbert thing. I mean, I thought oh, that's just his job to basically make, you know, <laughs> um, the, the, the guy in charge of PR at DC or um, sales rather at DC, uh, who's no longer there, a guy named John Cunningham was an awesome guy. Um, love him to death. Really smart guy knows, knows what he's talking about. Um, John was like, this is the first time a DC books gotten on late night television since the death of Superman. So he's like, I thought it was a great thing. It was like the first issue sold out because of that. So what happens? Um, the day that book came out, uh, uh, as you guys all know, DC was in the middle of a very big, very long merger with AT&T. So the day that book came out was the new boss, um, I believe her name is Pamela Lifford. It's her first day on the job. And that book comes out. And <laughs> it, goes, it goes on Stephen Colbert, and, and the, shit hits the, fan, the shit hits the fan internally. And um, we're talking about someone who comes from Disney and comes from the world of toys. And so this yeah. was like... So this was basically like, what the fuck? Like, how am I going to sell underwear to the licensors when people are like, well, you know, what are you guys, what are you guys doing essentially? Let's just be clear about one thing. So that page was done a year, maybe a year and three months before the book was printed. So that page existed for a long, I, all three pages <laughs> existed for a long, long time before any of this stuff happened. And I think everybody internally was way more concerned about the end of the, the last page of the first book than um, than yeah. they were right. about. The, <laughs> I, I, I literally remember being in the DC offices, the San Diego before the book came out, and the guys at DC Direct were like, "Oh my God, we want to totally want to make a statue of the Joker crucifix, but we could never do that." And that's mm. what those guys were talking <laughs> about. I mean, the discussion. The discussion internally was that. And so I feel like p even people internally were just like, I'm sure they were aware of it, I, you know, but and I was and let, let's just be clear about this, too. I was completely aware of it. It's not like, I, it, you know, I, I was I, I, I will be totally honest. I knew it would be talked about, but I never, ever expected the reaction that happened because I was under the impression that we were doing D.C. as if done by HBO. Black Label was supposed to be yeah, exactly oh, yeah. by HBO. Okay, well, so that was that was our mar that was our marching orders. Essentially, and, was like and, cursing, no problem, which now is no longer even the case. Mm. Um, oh wow! You know, all this shit is 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 and and so okay, let's go back to where the book comes out. Book comes out, shit hits the fan, and book sells out. Okay. Brian and I are pretty stoked about that. And we, we, I mean, honestly, neither one of us really gave a shit about why, because we were all like, look, I mean, we know the world we're living in. I mean, you know, it like if you go on Twitter to get your reactions to stuff, that place is a fucking cesspool. It's like, you'll see the worst <laughs> of the worst. Like, it does not reflect the, the, the way things really are often. So, um, so essentially we were, we were pretty stoked and, um, and, and, New York Comic Con is coming up, and um, right before New York Comic Con, the book is sold out at this point, and we find out that the book is not being will not go back to press, and that they censored the digital versions of the book. So if they censored that, that means that someone before the book came out had to have gone in and censored those those images internally. So they knew it was there, and they purposely censored the digital versions. I think because. 
all, all ages people can buy those online, right? And in comic shops, I think they trusted comic stores to sell the book to a more adult audience as it was always done in the past. You know, like I remember getting, I remember not being sold uh, certain um, suggest suggested for mature readers books at DC in the eighties because my comic shop owner was like, nah, nah, you're too young. So, so anyway, week before New York Comic Con, Brian and I are both going, we get emails from DC saying, yeah, we don't, you know, we were scheduled to do panels. We were scheduled to do interviews. Yeah, we're dropping all the interviews. We're dropping you guys from panels because we need to shift our focus. So we get those uh, emails internally and we're like, ah, this is probably a bigger deal than, than uh, we initially expected. Um, I see one of the publishers of DC at the DC party, Titans premiere party. And I say, hey, let's go back to print. The book sold out. And he tells me, I quote, don't be greedy. That was his quote to me. So I was like, wow, what a fucking dick. Um, <laughs> so, so at this point, at this point, I'm well aware that people inside on a high level are not happy with the way um, with what happened with the book, with the way things are going. I'm thinking awesome. Like the book's doing really well. If see that in my mind, controversy or um, mixed reviews, like these things don't bother. I think, I think these things are actually good because if, if like, if, if the book comes out and everybody loves it, there's a problem in my opinion. You know, it's like, it's, that's weird. If, if the book comes out and doesn't uh, have some kind of reaction, um, then you're just doing the, you know, the same old, same old. Then honestly, I did not expect that reaction to come from a shadowy dick. But, you know, um, that, that was just that's that's the, that's the world we live in, I guess. So that, that's um, why, you know, we'll so never it, have a true mature audience with yeah. comics. You know, we're always a little bit immature. Right. I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, they decide not to go back to press on the book, which was a, a huge mistake on their part. Um, and essentially from there forward, the ending of issue two gets changed. So I redraw pages from issue two, not once, but twice. So um, wow. my, I, bas I basically did uh, seven new pages altogether um, and had to readjust that last page like three times. Damn. So um, so that was all – that took about a month and, a, and maybe a little bit more than a month of work just to fix issue three – our issue two. And at that point, honestly, we were a little worried that the book was going to get canceled because mm. everybody was basically like, stand, everybody was on standby mode. And I was like, okay, so we're burning daylight on issue three. I think I'd done the first three pages of issue three or something at that point in time. And then I had to go back and do the adjustments and we blew all that, all that time on issue two. Everything is getting, getting fucked up. And um, we're realizing very quickly that people inside don't really know what to do they're just making reactionary decisions to make sure that the same thing doesn't happen with the second issue that happened with the, with the first you know the i guess the icing on the, the only icing you can get on that cake is that like for everybody out there who felt like there was huge huge changes being made to the book really only three slash four pages from the second issue were really the only problematic pages for them okay. Can you tell us which pages um, so, those were? Yeah, the very end, the very end of the book, um, and I and I I I, I, I don't really want, I can't really say what they were going to be because yeah, it's the end of that. So the sequence with Harlequin at the end, uh, quite quite different, um, and yeah, it, it was it definitely had sexual content in it, um, but it was a really big moment in the story because for anybody who's familiar with. Dante's Inferno. What's the second ring of hell? It, it's lust. So it, you know, the end of the book was supposed to be like succubus. You know what I mean? And and again, that that uh, that Harley scene with her unzipping her her um, her suit was really meant to show that autopsy scar, which was hopefully a big you know a big uh, clue to people about like ah something something's not right here. Like. Why would she have an, you know, an autopsy scar? What, what's, what's going on here? Without getting too much into that, because eventually I do still hope that that shit will get published at some point or another. I really hope that it will, maybe not for a few years down the line, but 
I really hope that eventually we'll see the um, the light of day, and I, and I think that's a possibility. Not now, <laughs> not not now for sure, but um, but down the line, yeah. And, and uh, so that got so that got changed, and then some issues were brought up about um, what black label was going to be, what was going to be changed because of all of this, and most of that didn't. I think that people. Um, at that point in time, didn't really, uh, people didn't really understand the fact that it wasn't our book that necessarily broke that down. It was just, it was a, it was a change that was already, in, it was going to happen whether our book was there or not. There was going to be a more family friendly turn of, of, uh, uh things at the DC were going to go more family friendly. And it, to a certain extent, I mean, it was going to be the new direction of, of the company. And, and I think now people are now that's very clear. You know, I mean, they're they're basically doing a lot of things, um, uh, you know, there'll, there'll still be some quote unquote adult books with with Black Label, but definitely nothing like what what could have been. You know what I mean? With 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 Black Label um, as it was originally intended to be. So anyway, um and that's a shame. That's, it is. But, you know, it's it's the nature of um, I, I look at it like this. It's the nature of big corporate business. You know, these characters are huge uh, franchise, billion dollar franchise characters. And they they don't what they care about is the brand. You know what I mean? And, and right. what they don't what they don't realize is that me drawing Batman's dick does not ruin that brand. You know, the problem really was this big merger and the fact that when all was said and done, I think that. You had you had a new boss who was not uh, not ready for for what was for I don't think really was prepared internally for what happened. But anyway, get, moving moving past that, um, the thing that was the only thing that I guess I could say at the end of the day that we were we were really happy about was we got to still finish the story the exact way we wanted to finish the story. I mean, there was no tinkering um on an editorial level other than having to take the fucks out of the last issue because uh, even though there was language in the first two all of a sudden on the third issue it was still no it was no longer cool so um so again this these rules are being made kind of as we speak and because our book was coming out at the time our book suffered through all of those rule changes you know what i mean every step of the way we got we got hit with those but the the biggest crime, in, in my opinion, that they committed, management at DC committed, was when you do that to a book, you undermine the ability to tell the story. Because no matter what I say publicly or what Brian says publicly, people always will think that the book was tampered with to an X amount of, uh, you know what I mean? Like they, they think that the purity of the vision is no longer there. And, you know, they may be right to a certain extent, but um, the story is still the story we want to tell. You know what I mean? Like it, it, at the end of the day, we got, we didn't get to do things. We didn't get to go as far as, as we would have liked to, to do, to do. And the end of the second issue, the original ending was, you know, I think was the kind of the perfect display on our part of, um, of using adult material, but having it actually matter for the story, you know, like having it actually make, make sense because that's another, I, I, you know, I read a lot of, um, of people complaining that, you know, for what, for X reason, they didn't feel like, they were like oh, you know, well, in my opinion, showing a, a naked back dick isn't what constitutes a mature rated book or a mature book. And I'm like, well, you know, I, I, I think that it all is part of the same, the same thing. You know what I mean? I think that, you know, when you, when you push things to a, to a certain level, um, you hope that all that stuff kind of falls under, under an umbrella of what's adult, you know what I mean? And, and uh, if, if we had drawn Batman jerking off in the Batcave, maybe I would have said, yeah, that was a little unnecessary. <laughs> but, but uh, <laughs> you know, in, 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 any, in any event, like we, we, get to tell, we get to tell the story that, that we want to tell. Um, at, you know, so that for that matter, I was, I was happy because for, for a while we were very, we were very concerned that all of this would bring about number one, maybe the third issue would never come out and, and maybe, and maybe uh, on a, on a strictly story level, people would come in and say, no, 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 this is not, you know, 
this is not what we what we want to be publishing anymore. So I think that what, was our fears as well, is that, you know, they'd spent all this time promoting Black Label, Black Label, Black Label, and hyping us as readers up. And then we get the first issue of Damned, and we're like, we're loving it. And then all that shit hit the fan over a small issue. <clears throat> and one, I was scared that Damned was not going to be completed. Or, like you right. said, watered down. But... Right. I also hate the fact that, you know, that issue took precedence over the story that was being written by you and Brian. And I'm very happy that, you know, you still got to complete your story. And, yeah, you may have had to tweak it a little bit, but it still, you know, had the vision and, the you know, told the story that you wanted to tell. And, you know, I want to applaud you on that but this issue three man i mean you had to tweak some things but there's definitely some elements that we never see in like you know the the regular batman or detective comic mainstream mm -hmm. issues like right. especially that scene in crime alley you know that was that was yeah. pretty intense that's an issue i think that needs to be talked about too is with all this is like um so you know no to naked body parts, but yes, yes to choking the shit out of people or or showing a uh, head wound on Thomas Wayne. You know, like every time, every time I turned in a page with like the Thomas Wayne blown head open page, I was just like, I'm gonna show this from the angle that shows he got shot in the, in the head. And my yeah. one said, no one ever said shit. Yeah. So as as with, I guess it shouldn't surprise me at all, but it's like there's really. I'll tell you guys another another funny story to get, bring a little levity to all this because I love it. Um, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, New, York, uh, New York Comic Con. Uh, Brian and I go to Frank Miller's studio, and Bri Frank says, "Bring the book." <laughs> so we bring the book, and Frank's like, "I want to see the battle." <laughs> so we we bring the book in, and Frank looks at it and he goes, "Is this what like?" is this what the big deal is? He thought, he's like, I thought you guys did like a Richard Corbin den thing where it was like, you know, where it was like, you know, huge and swinging around. And, and, and <laughs> Batman dingo. Yeah. There. yeah. He, he looked at me, he looked at me and he just, he was at his drawing table and he just looks up to me and goes, and he looks at me and he shakes his head and he goes, man, people, there's, there's just something about, you know, Western culture and dicks. And I was like, yeah, the, there really, there really is. There really yeah. is something. It's like the moment people see that, that everybody reverts back to like a, I don't know, like a, like a kid, and it's like they want to chuckle and point. I, you know, it's just, it's a really weird thing because even at conventions, I've been at conventions since then, and dude, I can see from like twenty feet away when someone is look on the face, just like here we go. This, this motherfucker is gonna make some comment about. <laughs> And like without fail, and without fail, it's like Trunks. it's like they it's like they come up and they think, they come up and they think they're like the first person to ever make the joke they're making. Like to, like people come up people who come up and they're like they're like oh it was, sure was cold in that bat cave. And I was like dude that was hilarious. That was hilarious the first two hundred times I heard it. I was like you know, I, 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 it was funny. <laughs> but like, but, but everybody is under the impression that they're the first to make a joke about that, and so I'm just like, wow. It's just at a certain point, you just you just go like, dude, like, like you know, let let it go, <laughs> like let yeah. really let let it go. I love, there was there was one awesome joke where I like someone I forget where it came from where someone was just like, oh, thank God his parents aren't alive to see this. <laughs> I like. I, I, I like <laughs> <laughs> I, I admit, I chuckled. I got a good chuckle out of that one. But uh, but yeah, no, I mean, it was. it's just like you can tell that people really, I mean, they're like fucking grown men. And they walk up to you with like this, like, hee 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 hee. Like they can't, really, they can't wait to tell me their bat, their bat joke. And even other comic book professionals, it's just like they, they can't hang, man. Like they just seriously can't hang. Like, yeah. like I'm like, they pay you to write like major comic books and you're here chuckling with a really bad like batman dick joke that like if you if you know it's like it's not funny <laughs> you know and but they pay you to write comics what so like anyway industry news, yeah. man that uh that immature section of people who who latched on to the attention of the book also had a negative uh, effect on those who wanted the book 
just because you know like you mentioned the the book didn't go back to a second printing and that left a lot of money on the table yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. there are people like i work in a comic shop and still to this day we have people that come in at least a couple people a week will walk in and ask if we have a, a copy of issue one of damned because they, they well, didn't get a copy of it not only that but they, they undermined our ability to sell and luckily the sales were super strong i mean we we actually sold more of issue two and issue three each each issue actually raised the number which is kind of crazy even with that but um, they undermined our ability to do that even better because had more people been able to get a hold of issue one and look, I mean, I'll be honest, like Batman is not my character. If they want to censor it, it's totally their right to do so. I, you know, I, I cannot, um, I'm not going to go to battle with Warner media on censorship about their characters. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, it's not, it has nothing to do with me, but what, what was sad and like i said eventually undermined us to a great extent was like you know people don't want to buy issue two and issue three of a story when they can't buy issue one you know That's they want point, to yeah. start the story and be able to then read the consecutive issues mm. so um i've had a lot of complaints about people going like yeah we got copies of issue two still left but because people don't like people don't want to read them if they haven't been able to read the first issue mm. so that's i mean it, major major problems on a management level i mean that that just is clear i think clear to everybody at this point i mean it's not even me talking trash because i'm the um you know i've been the recipient of that but like on a on a on a more fucked up le level that i think a lot of people don't really get um is that like at, at new york con especially brian and i like people were coming up to us, other pros going like, oh, thanks a lot. You're going to be responsible for my favorite editor getting fired. And I was like, what? Like, you know, and that, of course, never happened. But people all of a sudden jumped to this conclusion that firings that were people were talking about firing since the merger started, you know. Yeah. So everybody was about who was going to lose their job at D.C. Um, and when our book hit, people literally laid the blame on us for what they thought was going to be impending firings were going to have something to do with our book and they didn't uh you know but that's people were seriously laying that shit on us you know in in new york um which was which really clued me into this whole uh, like uh, quote unquote brotherhood uh, you know <laughs> in uh in in comics because it's like man like that you know uh, who, who would have thought that a shadowy penis would have been like you know <laughs> The cause is so much uh, unrest. It's so ridiculous. I would have never thought. I, the first time we, we all read it, like Robin said, my reaction was the same. It was like, oh shit, you know, Batman's dick. All right, whatever. Next, you know, moving right along. It's And then the fact that people, and now even industry guys, can't even handle this shit. No. It's just, I don't even know. It's it, it, There's a part of it that's humorous but another part i feel that's almost sad and embarrassing like the shit you wouldn't see this shit in europe like with european comics or whatever it's just it makes zero sense to me but and them not releasing that second print does screw a lot of collectors over that did want to read the book but on the right. flip side it's weird because there i feel like there's a lot of lore behind this book as well now batman damned you know because it, oh, it, it yeah, ended really yeah. well d despite you know say, not to say that the ending was an actual ending but the, you know, the way the three issues came together, I think, was melded really well. And there's a lot of lore. And the writing and the artwork is, uh, is top shelf, obviously. You guys put in a lot of work on this as well. And uh, I think this a lot, I think a lot of good came out of it as well. I think we don't look... In, I, don't, I think we don't focus enough on the good right now because uh, because it's a fantastic book. And I want to ask you, do, do you do you feel like this is... Do you feel like this is another half, the second half of... Or the next part from the Joker, like... Could Joker and Batman Damned be feel like it's w as if one book, in a way? Because that's how I read I, it, in, we, in a way, for the first time. We definitely wanted to make that um, the case for anybody who wanted to. I mean, the ending of the book is clearly a reference to the ending of Joker, you know. Yeah. And it's 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 like um, um, we, you know, we we definitely wanted that to to be the case, but we were very wary of doing something that people had to read either one or felt like. Um, they had to read Joker to read this or vice versa. We just wanted, we wanted it to be, um, 
a story that felt more mythological, like more, more that played more with the mythology of Batman too, and and what it what it um, you know I, I feel like they they're almost more like companion. I can consider them more companion pieces than really um, like a, a book and a sequel or or or, or something like that. Yeah. But like, but for me, you know, it's like um, the other big the other big thing that you realize is that there's such a uh, uh, Batman as a character is, is so powerful in 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 the sense that um, uh, he's a really like mythologically. There's a lot of stuff that comes into play when when you start to go down that road. You know, the whole Batman Joker road. Things become very um, very quickly. There are elements of that mythology which I think everybody knows stand very tall and strong. You know what I mean in the in the what do you want to call it? The uh, not the continuity of the character, but but you know the myth. Yeah, the mythology of the character. So the fact that Brian starts out the book in issue one referencing the Killing Joke, and and that's where kind of we wind up is just our 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 way of one of our ways of just nodding our hat at this massive, you know, tipping our hat at this massive mythology that that um, anymore anymore I feel like you just it's it's omnipresent when you. When you write Batman, you know, or yeah. draw Batman. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I remember, yeah, when I'm at, like I said last time, I remember when The Joker came out, when you guys put that out. That is a mainstream book. Like, you, every, like, all the hardcores have it, but all the casuals have it too. It's just one of, a lot of, you see the tattoos everywhere as well of your work. It's just, yeah. you know, it's just stamped all over the place in terms of uh, its reach. And I feel like Dan is going to go in the same direction which is really good um i I want to point out since we're talking about joker right now uh as a companion piece to damned uh if anyone listening has yet to read joker it is about to be released for the first time as a paperback so you'll have a great chance to pick it up if you haven't already yeah usually comic shops order a lot of Mm. the paperbacks too for because they have a lot of people coming in that are just getting into it and whatnot and uh that's something that'll definitely be flying off the shelves to uh to to new readers actually as well as well well while we're plugging books, <laughs> while we're plugging books, I will just add this really quickly about the hardcover of Damned. Is they are including two pages that were taken out of issue two. Nice. And these two pages weren't uh, censored pages. They were um, – issue two wound up being 49 pages, and we needed to cut two pages out of that for the print. Apparently, they couldn't print – um, they couldn't, they couldn't accommodate that page number for, I forget whatever reason, but, uh, but th- those two pages at the beginning of the book will go back into the hardcover, um, which I'm stoked about because about the, they tie in very much to the, um, some of the visual motifs, like from the beginning of issue three, that the whole bat heart thing mm-hmm. and, and I love they, that, that page, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, so so some of that some of that stuff will go back into the hardcover when the hardcover comes out, and I just saw the PDF. There's a shit ton of black and white pages in there. There's designs. There's um, Brian Brian wrote like an afterwards, and and he explains like our how we created the book and some of the particulars about that. So the hardcover is actually pretty pretty cool. It's got this beautiful like. Um, uh, now I sound like a salesman here, but anyway, nah, bear, bear it, with man, me. that's awesome. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> just okay, I'll finish that for you. Uh, the hardcover, I believe, is uh, scheduled for September, right? Do, now. do we know right. what the dimensions are on that, Rob? Do you know, like, it's the same. It's the same exact dimensions of the uh, printed book. That's what and, I was hoping for. And, yes, awesome. yeah, same, same Sweet, dimensions, man. and it's it's yeah. got a transparent slipcase. Oh wow! So there's a slip case that's transparent with an image printed on it, and so when you take, so you know the um, double page spread of Gotham City from issue two, that mm-hmm. is kind of like the what would have been underneath this the um, what do you call it the dust jacket, and so the transparent dust jacket will you'll be able to see through it a little bit to see some of that double page spread, and um, yeah, it's really nice. It came, yeah, exactly. There you go. Yeah, so it it came out really came out really nice. They did a really really nice job with the design of it and everything. Oh, so um, oh, that's fucking awesome. So yeah, hopefully hopefully uh, that's that's great news as well for ends. us as readers. As you mentioned <laughs> earlier, that kind of solves the problem with people that may not want to buy this book because they can't get issue one. Now you're going to get all three of them in hardcover. Mm. Yeah, 
Unfortunately, it will be censored. It will it will be censored. That that there's no turning them around on that. We've we've tried. You know, um, one, one little one little panel. And it's I mean, not even censored. It's like you're just gonna throw a little black on the uh, that yeah, glimpse of light know, sliver yeah, on yeah. his penis. You know, that's all yeah. it is, really. And I, I um, uh, and this and this will probably add fire to the people who say like, "Well, it was unnecessary. Why put it in there in the first place?" It's like. You know, dude. Like the, the the moment people start picking at the what's necessary and what's unnecessary scab, like shit starts bleeding really quickly. So, I mean, <laughs> I I think that think that when it, I think that when it comes down to it, um, yeah, you know, like the story remains intact, and and uh, and and while I felt like that was a, a cool, you know, thing, a cool thing that made this book a bit a bit different, you know, I'm I'm ultimately pretty pleased with the uh, with the way that the, the the story kind of came out in in the end despite it being a complete fucking there to uh you and brian were given the orders of hey do this like as if it was you know like an hbo show so right. that's what you guys did i'm surprised that there was i mean the whole bad dick whatever but i mean i'm surprised like you because you brought it up more people weren't complaining about that last page of damned number one mm. Yeah, no one even right talked now. about that. You know? yeah. yeah, I'm surprised yeah. that there weren't. I, I did. I did get a little bit of hate for uh, making a Christmas card of that, but. So, Lee, what what does the future look like now for you? What, um, what are your plans in the industry? Um, well, I mean, fuck. I wish I could give more specifics right now. I'm definitely doing something for the other big uh, publisher. It's a short story. So I'm doing something for them and then um, definitely going to create our own, create our own stuff after that. Oh, there's, um, yeah. yeah, there's, there's, uh, I mean, uh, honestly, the, the, and look, I, I, I will say this too in regards to DC. It's like, I've been, I've been working at DC for 20 years and, um, and later on, I, I can't say, I was hoping it would be announced by now. I, I can't talk about it until it's, it is. But this October, um, something will come out uh, that kind of has, uh, let's just say, uh, 20 years of my DC work will be um, all in one in one place. Nice. But, um, nice. yeah, so for that, that's... Uh, not, not, not quite an artist edition, but something, something pretty cool. And... Um, it will be uh it's a nice way to kind of cap that 20 years of working with that publisher and and um and it's not like i won't work with dc you know i'm sure i'll still do covers here and there but uh you know like i feel like every come like this hat this is just one of the natural cycles of these big these big publishers it's like they go through certain periods of time where um as a creator you can kind of fit in in that company you know and now that they've cl- they're clearly moving in a direction where uh what i want to do doesn't vibe with what they want so it's like I, I don't feel like you can really have bad blood about that it's just the nature of it's a not like i said the natural life cycle of these of these big companies and and uh, you know is it something that I, are they going to be doing stuff that i want to read probably not you know but um th- that's just the way i mean i'm sure people who were reading comics in the 70s felt that like that you know 60s and 70s felt like like that about comics that started coming out in the 80s so it's just you know it's just part of the natural way things are going but it's also just for me personally it's a good time to go um telling other stories that you know i have i have in mind so uh yeah i'm you know excited to do that i think that the, the i think that damned if this is you know kind of a you know closing of the your chapter at dc i think it's a a brilliant way to you know close that door you're leaving on a awesome footnote that's already hit with so many fans i mean and also not just readers but also collectors because this book has instantly been picked up by like prime one and you've got like multiple statues coming out based on this and other collectibles coming out so I think you and Brian hit on something that, you know, fans and readers, you know, really appreciate. Are, are they going to send you that, that new uh, damn Joker Prime 1 statue? Man, that thing looks yeah, gorgeous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, should, I should get a, 
I should get one of those. I mean, that, that damn statue is pretty impressive. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe they nailed the costume. That, I mean, and the turnaround <laughs> time was crazy. <laughs> I mean, you could pick all these characters out of this book, especially I, I, I would love to see like the, the Harley with the autopsy scar or, does, or, does that, or a antenna. dead man. And I, I, t- and, I told uh, you this last time and I'll say it again. Um, Thanks again for that Zantana. I, she, I love Zantana and it's not not many artists get her right, believe it or not. But you did an amazing Zatanna, so just no, yeah. yeah. and she yeah, she was she was awesome. It was it was fun to do. I love all those characters, like all the jail uh, dark characters. Yeah, yeah oh, I love those characters. They were my favorites. You know, Dead Man, all, all Specter. I loved I loved all those Swamp characters. Thing, great Swamp Thing. As Swamp well. Thing, oh, yeah, that was yeah, badass. I, I fucking love drawing Swamp Thing. <laughs> yeah. I don't. don't pass. <laughs> again <laughs> that cemetery but, scene was so cool it's like it brought me back to noel at first um oh, the, the tone yeah. and the mood right. and then swamp thing comes out constantine and then the statues go crazy i'm like holy shit like just balls to the walls man that was yeah that was really cool I, man i i would love to see well they they could they would never be able to compliment your your art style but like just imagine like a a, an animated form of this somehow way shape or form or something it would just look so it would just look so cool to see this in motion as well but uh but yeah hey, i love i love how you threw uh azarello in in the uh <laughs> the club scene <laughs> i always yeah, I was, yeah he's in he's in uh he's in luther too i forget if i drew him in joker i, I don't have know to look now i think he's in i think he's in rorschach too i think i drew him in rorschach at some point <laughs> what, what did he say about that <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing. Yes. he's fun because <laughs> he's an interesting looking guy as no, no nobody nobody will be concerned as long as you don't draw the azarello penis in the issue right yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> what if we get an azarello well from? azarello might be concerned <laughs> No, I, I think I think now if there's one clear message from from all of this, it's like I think that that's what you do if you want to immediately find yourself embroiled in, um, you know, the the uh, the biggest bullshit news story in comics. Well, well, not, actually, if you think about it, if it was, I thought it was perfect marketing. It was brilliant. Yeah, but if it. if it was like Constantine's dick. I don't think anyone will give a fuck, right? No. It's because it's Batman that it's like, oh, Batman's yeah. dick. Man, Alex, wait, wait, Alex Ross, uh, Alex Ross made a very good point. He's, he he also he also did, and he, I think he should know because he's been doing this a long time. He told me he told me he was like, look, there's something about that really affects people in a different way. If this was because you know they showed um, Spider-Man's dick in in that uh, Kari Andrews Spider-Man book, oh. and no one really. No one really made a big deal about it, but Kari's style was much cartoonier, you know, it was much more, um, and, and Alex was like, look, the moment things get real, people, it really affects people in a different way. Like if you draw a realistic looking, uh, person naked, it's not like seeing a a cartoon, you know what I mean? Immediately the cartooniness of something makes it, um, uh, more jovial or more kind of, you know, there's, there's something about realism that I think adds a little bit of that um, effectiveness to, to the to the to the impact the image has on people yeah people can't separate it between yeah. reality versus comic well, I guess. It, it, well it's it, realism is meant to be taken more seriously hence the old masters and new oh. portraiture where you're supposed to stand and analyze and break it down in a a tight <laughs> manner you know it's it, it, it's how it's presented I suppose and I think you know the difference right. between nudity and being naked almost so like there's there's like um there's a uh, I, I think the the other big thing here is like I think there's a difference between nudity and being naked you know what I mean I think that's that's a, that's something that I, I I thought about while doing it which is like well how you know if, if you if you draw someone um nude to me there's an element of, of voyeurism to that you know what i mean where it's like on a nude uh sculpture a new painting it's like it's meant to be like you said it's meant to be seen and yeah. and there's something about being naked that i feel like was what that the purpose of that scene was you know it was like to show this guy who it's a vulnerability as well I suppose. right yeah just something about this mytholo- you know these these mythological people it's like at a certain point how do you humanize them really how do you humanize a guy who's been almost you know completely dehumanized throughout the years by the way he's been written and and drawn i mean he's a superhero now you know he's not he's not a man anymore yeah 
So how do you, how do you go about doing that? How do you, and you know, it's it's something that not everybody not everybody agrees with, and that's cool too. You know what I mean? It's cool to have the conversation, and I and I I'm disappointed when it when people don't want to have that conversation because it just means that you know they're they're interested in if they're interested in reading regular monthly Batman, that's there for them. You know, that's out there for them, and and it will be in varying forms of quality every month on the on the racks for for people. So it's like I feel like there's got to be room for this with characters like Batman, or Superman or whoever, because there's so much other product with them that like, do people really just want to see the same shit like over and over again? You know what I mean? Like there's, there's part of me that really wonders that if there is an element of this, um, we really do want to see the same stuff over and over and over again. Cause it's comfortable or I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's all stuff that I've thought about a lot. Um, you know, recently, but, uh, to, to touch on the, is this necessary argument? Like we talked about last time and just came up again. Now that the purpose of the scene was showing his vulnerability, uh, in right. that moment. And as soon as you make an effort to not show things like that too, whether you cut the image off above the waist or have shadow purposefully obscuring that area, it's getting into the point where it's very clearly being omitted for people's sensibilities. It's like when you watch a TV show that is on network television, like something like The Walking Dead. It's been going for years, yep. and it's the situation where for years people have been killing each other and seeing their loved ones murdered, getting shot and stabbed, and their, their bodies ripped open. But no one has ever said the word fuck. Right, and, right. <laughs> this non-realistic world right. uh, it's a very weird you know you can choke the shit out of harlequin on a rooftop but you can't show her boobs you know yeah. i mean it's a really weird um it's a really weird double standard but did you read dark knight well, three i did yeah yeah i did read that yeah and they yeah, showed you're talking about. they showed wonder woman breastfeeding and no one right. said one thing about it yeah for 30 years, we've seen, doc, you know, Dr. Manhattan, Right. <laughs> you know, and like you alluded to, Peter, Peter, Peter little Peter Parker, I, I think. It's because Batman's getting a star on the Walk of Fame. Yeah, well, that's true. Batman's just but, so high profile that it's, it's, it's so it's high profile. One of those things. I remember reading an interview with Barry Windsor Smith where he was talking about drawing Weapon X. And he was saying that he drew Wolverine naked and that Marvel guys were like, no, you got to. You got to cover that up. We can't do that. And he said he he cross hatched over it, some shadow over it, and it's still apparently like in, it was an in ink, so you could still apparently see the the shape of the, the the penis underneath that. And he said he kept having to cross hatch over this penis to the point where it just looked purposely like he was trying to cover this dude up. And and um, I remember thinking like, what the fuck, man, like. Weapon X is literally a guy running around naked for like how many pages? I mean, it's literally a comic book about a guy running around naked and, uh, you know, fighting bears and shit like that. So how on how what what on earth could have been harmful about showing the dude really naked? I mean, ultimately, the story doesn't have that in it. Does it matter? No, it really doesn't matter in the end of the day. It's just the point of like. Why did why would it have to be a big deal if he did? Yeah. You know what I mean? Why would that somehow like people I did read people going like it took it took me totally took me out of the story and I'm like, well then what the fuck is your obsession with a dick then? <laughs> like <laughs> to me, to me, it more about yeah. you than it yeah. does about the story, you know? Yeah. Like, it's, <laughs> not, and it's not like it's you know, um a you know, a two-page spread where it's a zoom in on <laughs> right. the fucking dick and you start seeing veins or anything. I mean, come on, it's uh, whatever. I, I, oh, I, I, it's gonna yeah. be. Tw it's almost twenty twenty, and it's like I just can't understand this. The still weird, prudish level of immaturity with some people. I just yeah. even, well, even though Batman's I mean, like high profile. Robin, would this go right. down in Canada? Would Canadians give a fuck about a, a line on a dick? I, I don't know that it seemed to be uh, as big a deal here. I don't know that it made it to any of our limited uh, television shows or anything like that. Yeah. But uh, re reactions to it uh, at the shop were really, really light. Uh, I yeah. mostly just still to this day have people that just want to 
have a copy of it because they want to have the series. They're they're apologizing for not buying it. That's what. Yeah. The, yes. <laughs> so moving past Dick Gate, I've yeah, got some yeah, questions yeah. about sure. issue three. Sure. sure. Um, one, we were kind of talking about um, this before we got on, started recording, it, and you jumped on. And one thing about this book is that you know you know it's got these elements: supernatural, the mysticism, the the mystery level and stuff like that. And three people had three different interpretations of certain scenes. Awesome. That was pretty cool because I like stories that are open-ended where it lets the reader interpret, you know, things. And one thing I noticed in the crime alley scene is that, uh, Enchantress has like the upside down infinity or Omega sign, you know, the ohm sign in her face. Was that your idea or was that something that Brian had an idea for? That I, I honestly, hand to God, I never thought about that. That's the first time anybody's ever brought that to my attention. I, I, I literally just wanted to draw this kind of cracked porcelain doll looking little demon chick. And uh, I, uh, yeah, that's, that was totally not at all my intention. But I, hey, you know, that's cool. It's, it's one of those <laughs> weird things where. Because I yeah. think it really makes it really cool. I think, I think that, I think, you know, that those are the things where maybe happy accidents, I don't know what you want to call it, but look, if, if, again, if people have a, um, if people have different, you know, interpretations of it, I, I always think that's a good thing. I mean, I think one of the best things about Killing Joke, at the end of Killing Joke, was everybody wondering if he strangled him or if they were just, la- I mean, there was a bit of ambiguity to that last scene. Mm. And even ambiguity about like what Joker did to Barbara Gordon, and there was room right. for people to, there was room for people to have discussion about it, and, and people uh, different people have different completely different takes on that, and so I I always enjoy that myself when stuff is a bit more it lets you tell the story to yourself, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, there was part of that that included um, or was involved in the very end of Joker because you know the. The book ends on the bridge, and I, you know, mm-hmm. if we're gonna go full spoiler, we can kind of talk about it. But, you know, the way I yeah. interpreted it was that Johnny Frost had been shot by Joker, like looked like his mouth and jaw had been shot off, right? And oh. and Joker and Battle are fighting, and and Johnny's kind of creeping up against the edge. And then the last scene of the book, you can kind of see a small image of someone off the bridge. I thought that right. was Johnny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, now I, I think we can kind of see that maybe that's not true. I think that was part of the point was like what, you know, what uh, um, when when Brian and I started the possibility of doing it, a seat to Joker, the first thing I remember saying all like years ago was first, where's Batman while this story is happening? What what is Batman doing throughout this entire story? You know? Um, and so that was a big jumping on point for us. It was mm. like, okay, well, let's just, ne- we've never really done a Batman. We've never really done a Batman book where it's Batman. It's all Batman all the time, <laughs> you know? Like, uh, uh, even in Batman Death Blow, which is the first thing we did together, I mean, Batman was much more of like, uh, it certainly, the, the book was certainly not through his eyes or from his from his point of view in that, in that regard. And there was um, always at the end of Joker, I, it, we I, we had this conversation drawing that last sequence and I was like, I want to really pull back really far from the bridge. I just want to feel like you get sucked out of that because there's something epic and mythological about their, that, that fight between the two of them. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. and, and since, and since our book, and since our book wasn't in continuity, I like the idea that could it be the last fight between the two of them? Could it be, you know, there's, it's like this endless cycle of the Joker going to Arkham and getting out and going back and going, you know what I mean? It's like at a certain point you want to kind of, um, you know, that's going to happen in the regular books and, and you want to treat your own, or at least I want to treat my own books as if that's just it. You know what I mean? Like for me, that's, that's it. That's, that's, uh, Noel for me is like even a completely different thing than all, than all this stuff. It's just, that, um, but yeah, the, uh, the, the, there's an element of that ambiguity that i think can be frustrating but can also be liberating to readers because if they are involved enough in the story then they can interpret it how they want you know or or and it's fine to also have questions kind of linger you know i don't i don't see that as being 
a problem at all. I mean, you know, it's like, um, well, it, it you know, opens so, a discussion. Yeah. And some, and some of my favorite movies are, are, are a lot like that. You know, I mean, it's like, um, one of my favorite books is uh, a movable feast by Ernest Hemingway. And the end of the book is, I think like the, either the last paragraph or the second to last paragraph. Cause the whole book is his journal about him living in Paris when he was in his early twenties. And like, like right as the book ends, he goes, and then I met the woman who would fucking completely change my life. And you know, everything will you know, like, ru- I think he used the term ruin my life. And then I met the woman who would ruin my life. And like the book ends and you're like, what? <laughs> like, like, <laughs> hey, you know, give me that story, man. Like, I want to hear, I want to listen to that story. I remember finishing that book and being like, oh my God, like, I was just ravenously interested in Ernest Hemingway after that. It was like, <laughs> it was it was like him, it was him basically going, ah, you want to read all my other shit and you want to read about my life. And it was, you know, it was, a, it was a really, I felt like it was really effective, you know? So, um, I, I liked, I liked stuff like that. Can you give us a little insight in the rat? Mm, dead because, man, yeah. yeah, well, yeah, you know, Bran jumps into the guy with the rat on his shoulder. Who right. is that person? Or is that no. just a random, random guy? Who, who is you no, know, it was it was um, this hipster guy with uh, the guy who comes to brands and he's got like a rat on his shirt. Um, right. I don't know. It's, it's like to me, it was just like a Harry Potter kind of thing, right? Like okay. you got it. You like magic. You got you know, like yeah. You're just trying to throw weird shit in there, and uh, <laughs> and, and and Brian and I and Brian and I also going like who 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 like goes to a magic club and you know what kind of people populate this kind of environment and. We knew we wanted a rat in there, and, and a rat could have also been in the alley. But I had um, some, I had some other ideas. Uh, you know, all all this stuff is is just ways of of hopefully giving each of these characters um, like a moment in the story. You know what I mean? A moment to do their thing, and a, or a moment to not do their thing. You know, because uh, I didn't interpret the rat as just a, a literal animal, because the way it actually transposes into the the scene with right. crime alley with, you know, Constantine and Batman. I was like, somehow this rat went with him and then was able to interact with Enchantress. So this rat is something right. more than just an animal. Right. Right. Well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I feel like, like if I, I feel like if I talk too much about it, uh, it's like, there's an element where, I, I, I kind of want to leave some of this stuff up up in the air for people. You know what I mean? I know why I know why I did it, yeah. and okay. and I know why um and, and I know why Brian did it because I mean you know, obviously that was that was written for for a purpose. So I mean you know we we know there's certain things we we talked about too like um in the in the collection they wanted to print Brian's plot and Brian was like no 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 that like that's like why would we purposely give people all the answers? <laughs> like, why, right, why, would yeah. we <laughs> why would we purposely tell everybody why why we did, you know? Like, yeah, you can't uh, give your secret recipe away. Well, it's not even like a secret recipe. It's just like you want people you want people to be able to do wonder about that. People yeah. to kind of come up to yes. come to their own conclusions, you know? It's their like, own conclusions. Like, why, why I love lost. <laughs> Dude, that's like at Wendy's when you ask for um, honey mustard, but you only get one packet, boy. <laughs> well, and you, you mentioned uh, the ability of people to discuss some of the implications in The Killing Joke. And uh, right. they recently released the Absolute Edition, which includes uh, Alan Moore's original script for it and settles those two arguments. A mistake. We talked about that. We That was part of a recent discussion we had where we were like, that's a big fucking mistake it's like why do you want to ruin one of the best not ruin but it's, it didn't ruin anything for me but you know what i mean like you got to assume that these books are going to be read for the first time by someone years down the road you hope so maybe not but you hope so right so why would you want to give the first person maybe a person picks up killing joe for the first time in the absolute format and they read that they get to the end and they're like that's fucked up and then they read the actual plot, and they're like, "Oh, that's the answer to that," you know? Yeah, I like, agree, yeah. And then they don't read it after they're done. <laughs> all the years of wondering about that or talking about that with other people, and and um, sometimes you can kind of bullshit through uh, through 
stories. You know what I mean? Like some people, uh, it's a real fine line that you walk and maybe you cut, you pull it off and maybe you don't. And I don't feel like Brian and I are, are the ones who can really make that judgment. You know, everybody has to make it for themselves. But like, I remember David Lynch, um, talking about the black lodge and I don't think he's ever fully come out and said what the black lodge is and what, you know, I mean, people have a million different theories and I've I'm looking online, reading reading other people's theories about what, you know, for me, it's just like part of that fucking crazy world he created where I just go, it's fucked up. There's a dwarf speaking backwards. You know, it's just like (laughs) shit where you go, you know, what? And, and, but it fits into his vision. It works with his vision. It's not just something fucked up to be fucked up. You know, it's, it's part of a larger construct. One thing I liked about the book is that how you change certain dynamics between characters. And I'm more specifically like Thomas and Martha Wayne, you know, it kind of shows a picture and it kind of symbolic of the whole story as a whole, but you know, they didn't have a perfect relationship in this, in this book, which is not how it always shows in like the main DC titles. But maybe in, they, maybe well, they didn't have a perfect, maybe, book, you know, who knows, but <laughs> in black label, it kind of fits, you know, in this story, it's like, wow, here's another side that you never thought about. Maybe they weren't actually happy and they were just kind of, stuck together raising bruce that adds an additional component for you know his grief and and things you know throughout his life so i I thought that was really cool yeah i i I like that too Uh, but i mean you know it's again it's like it's like did he die in the alley did he not die in the alley? i mean there's there's just elements there you you feel like at that point um you know, it's, it, it really is just kind of uh, up to you to decide what's a construct of the story and what could be, you know, and what could be the case or not the case. But like I said, man, it's like these characters are so um, mythological now, like even yeah. Thomas and Martha Wayne. It's like those roles in the Batman story and how they contribute to everything about the character is um, undeniable. So if you, the moment you attack any of that, any of that kind of, any of those elements, it's, 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 you know, it's like, it's, it becomes a very delicate thing for a lot of people and it becomes very, but it also becomes a way into the story that maybe hasn't been approached before because it's not really changing anything about his origin, you know, it's just kind of uh, coloring in maybe bits and pieces of it in ways that haven't been colored in before. And if you don't, like I my attitude is people don't care for ladies and gentlemen this Wednesday which will be June 26 June 26 this Wednesday make sure to pick up Batman Damn number 3 by the great Libra Mejo and Brian Azarello it will sell out so grab your copy it will sell out and Lee before we let you go I just wanted to ask you I want your insight Sure. Where do you think um, uh, the big two is going in the future in terms of this push and pull, two, two steps forward, one step back? With I know Marvel does their own thing, but I think with DC now that uh, there's so many cooks and cooks in the kitchen or head cook, master right. chefs in the kitchen or whatever, and they want to lighten it up a bit, for lack of better terms. Where do Oof. you see it going in the in the future with this publishing company? Look, uh, this is a um First of all, thanks, guys. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you guys and and letting me come on and letting me talk a bunch of shit here. Um, But uh, (laughs) anytime, anytime, anytime. please come back. (laughs) Anytime. uh, Like this is a big. I think that's a big question because what's the best way to answer it? For uh, you know, I think that um, uh, something happened a few years ago, and a comic book through movies became very mainstream became very big dollar um, franchises, became very important to large corporations. And in the over the course of that happening, you had Marvel, which um, came out with a very distinct format of how they portrayed those characters in film, in comics. And, you know, the results um, economically are pretty undeniable. I mean, they, they have created a format that has completely fucked over a lot of other ways of doing those movies. And it's not like they set out to do that. It's just the success of those movies, I think, created an 
in most people's minds a very specific idea of how you do those things, of how you do those characters, of how you interpret those uh, stories about the the um, the narrative um, uh, markers that each of these stories need to have. And because of it, I mean, I, I refer to it as being very cookie cutter. Um, and it's not that I disrespect the work that they're doing. I think that there's there's some um, amazing stuff and, and stuff that Marvel movies do very well. But I think at this point, they have undeniably tainted the, um, the market in terms of like what people expect out of a superhero movie, comic, any, I mean, anything. So I feel like when you have that, powerful uh example in front of people you know what um why wouldn't a company like at&t go well why the fuck is our big superhero movie why did our big superhero movie, movie do so badly why 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 can't we why can't we follow that same formula and have the same results and you you find yourself in this kind of very weird um purgatory for lack of a better word where people are just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks and, and to see what what works and what doesn't work because there's this example of this like monolithic um corporation that's that's doing it and you know th there's literally no more money left in small countries i mean disney has it all there it's like they that you know like avengers took all the money out of the economy the, you know, so it's like the 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 um, why wouldn't AT and T being a corporate huge corporate entity go like well how do we achieve those same kind of results well they're clearly not doing anything very adult you know that 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 creates problems you can't sell that to as many people I mean dude when people see this Joker movie that's going to be a big uh, that's going to be a big um, possible turning point for things at at DC uh, if the movie does well you stand a chance of seeing more product that takes some chances if the movie doesn't do well um get ready for more you know fun family entertainment because it, it's it's <laughs> like they're just they're just gonna go like well that didn't work so uh, you know what do we have to do what do we have to do now that puts butts in the seats Shazam yeah. too so i mean there you know there's and not to say that everything needs to be dark or you know r-rated or it's not that the, the point is just that there's multiple ways you can do these characters and do them and do them well um and a company that has no experience in a corporation that has no experience in publishing like at&t you know they're, they're gonna have to learn shit the hard way and um part of that may be you know going a very um watered down i don't know how they're gonna that, you know they're gonna react given that across the street that you know shit is just they're they're dominating everything so again it's not like everything's on the shoulders of this joker movie it's just that you know these guys are, are doing something ballsy they're taking a, a big franchise character essentially in a, in a hardcore r-rated movie and uh we'll see we'll see if that bears fruit or not are, are you looking forward to that joker movie oh yeah 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 no, definitely i i mean it's it's gonna be i think it's gonna be very very cool and you know if if anything and if anything else like i said it's just nice to see something different but you know that's gonna be i can guarantee you um if that and birds of prey do well birds of prey i think is r2 although i won't be surprised if that's pg-13 by the time it comes out yeah. um if if both of those flicks do good they higher ups might start the higher ups might start to say uh well maybe we can push the content a little bit mm. a little bit further but right now it's a very um let's fly securely you know let's let's yeah. make sure everything's safe and very uh um so uh, where do i see the future of, of comics I, I think that um you know you got both of these two the big two who are just ever turning ever more into larger corporate entities you know so uh the unfortunate result of that is, is is things get tend to get a little bit more cookie cutter but um the stories that you know you always go back to you always reread you always talk about our classic stories like um or what will become a classic like the killing joke like you just said right. the ending um or like all three issues of batman damned you're gonna want to go back and read it because like you said you didn't want to give all the little clues or all the answers to the questions here talking with us and you said brian's not brian turned down the fact of them putting his entire 
plot and script in the book, you know, right. we're going to want to go back and read that. And, you know, people are going to be talking about Dan, just like the killing joke, just like White Knight, unlike some random Batman issue from the 80s that that doesn't there's no impact with with those. Right. But I, how awesome is it that Sean can do what he's doing on White Knight? And, you know, I think Sean's found like that kind of really awesome uh, middle ground where it's like it's not too dark. It's not. I, it's you know it's kind of like um for specifically for this moment in time it's kind of the perfect batman book right i mean it's it's kind of what is uh i see it as, as being very much like a uh, an important part of what's of what's coming out right now yeah. um and awesome for sean because it's like you know he's he's uh I think a creator that a lot of people are you know super interested in and and, and should be doing work like that you know what i mean that he wants to do how how he wants to do it so i mean you know it, it, when i say that um you know uh, it, it, stuff gets cookie cutter the great thing is you've got guys like sean out there doing something that's not cookie cutter you know what i mean yeah. you've got guys like him that's doing something really um unique and awesome on its own so i mean you know i, I from from that point of view it's it's you know, I'm sure there will be those shooting stars of things here and there. They're going to be really interesting, but you know, um, uh, well, anything that pushes the content, eh, you know, ultimately uh, the one thing I'll say just to cap everything off though, is that like, I feel pretty great about it. I mean, it, when, when all, when all said and done, you know, like I said, we, we, we got to tell the story that we, that we wanted to tell. But number two, for one, like really brief moment, a brief moment in time, um, a char- a, like a multi-billion dollar franchise character became a little bit counterculture, like for just a second. You know yeah. what I mean? Like there was <laughs> yeah. there was something there that was a little bit mm, and whatever. I mean, people are going to say, oh, you know, for a penis or whatever, you know, whatever they're going to say. But I. I, I don't know. There may be. I would like to think there's more to it than that. And like, um, only time will tell if the book matters or not. It doesn't matter in terms of the overall mythology. But uh, but you know, it's like uh, it's 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 you know, it was a it was a pain in the ass to make. I won't lie. <laughs> it, was, it was not an easy process. Yeah. Like from even from the beginning. But I mean, ultimately, I'm really I'm really. I'm really happy with it, and you know, I'm I'm happy that we got to do. Uh, you know, obviously, there's there's stuff in there I'd like to change artwork wise. That I don't feel you know works as well as I would have liked it to. But what I mean, I mean in the bigger way. You know? I think you should be proud because you and Brian pushed the envelope far enough that you built something that does and will have a legacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you should be proud because we 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 see how hard you have worked on this it's a it's you know it's undeniable and it's appreciated by us i'm i'm genuinely happy that you're generally happy with it and we are very happy with the end result of this book and i think that's how we should really end this on we are quite pleased and we're really quite pleased to know that not really too much was changed in book three i some things were but nothing nothing monumental and um and that's oh, a really good thing to know. They just took the fucks out. Yeah, like, you yeah. Know, we can ah. add those in as we read them internal dialogue. <laughs> you know, just, maybe it'll be an editor's cut. You know, DC said no fucks given. Damn. It's just that's exact. That was exactly it. But I mean, it was just it was. It's kind of funny though. I wonder if that's gonna read in the collection. It's like first two issues, the third issue is like <laughs> super cool. Version. I, I think, well, I think that'll be part of part of the the whole mythos behind the book. It'll be something that you know, twenty years from now, when the kids that the way people talk about Killing Joke now, twenty years from now, kids will go, "Oh yeah, I, I heard that." You know, the they had to change how the book was made at, after issue one came out. So mm-hmm. later in the in in the later issues, the, there's no more swearing. You know, it's interesting. Does it cost this? Doesn't Constantine say twat in this book? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so twat in in the UK is is like not that big of a deal. 
but twat yeah, yeah in, in America is a big fucking deal. Like, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's gonna be yeah. yeah. But like I said, head wounds, like massive, like bullet to the head, you know, brains on the pavement. Yeah. that's totally cool. Yeah, you that's, yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah, well, you know, violent culture. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's. I, I saw that and I was like, whoa. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the great and talented Lee Bermejo. Do not forget June twenty sixth. Wednesday, Batman Damn number three. It will sell. It will sell out. So make sure you get your copy. Brian Azzarello and the great Lee Bermejo. The Lee, thank you so much for coming on. Thank Thanks. you for your time again. Uh, you know, you. And you're gonna have to come back on when uh, if you start, you know, some creator own stuff or whatever it is you got going sure. on. We got to talk about that as well, because because uh, well, your talents will never be underappreciated here. We we see uh, the hard work you thank do. You. I really appreciate that, guys. And thanks again. Thanks again for having me. Hey Gotham Dwellers, make sure to stop everything right now and subscribe to Bat Force Radio. We can be found on iTunes and SoundCloud. Don't miss out. Guaranteed to satisfy all of your Batman and DC needs.